Good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to our midweek Bible study. Today we're going to be thinking of the lessons taught to us in Acts chapter 10, in particular the passage between verses 34 and 48. There has been some good news today. Um, I've heard on the BBC they're reporting that the executive has decided that churches will be able to meet together uh, physically in some form after the 29th of June, that's Sunday week. So whenever we get the details of what the government direction is, the Kirk session will talk about it and take a decision as to what we're doing. That decision will be communicated to you immediately. It does look, however, very hopeful that it will not be at all long before we're able to meet together in our meeting houses again. Until it becomes clear that everybody is able to join together uh, in worship in our meeting houses, I intend to continue to put up acts of worship or worship services uh, and preaching on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook page. So those will continue as normal. That's the new normal uh, for the next uh, while. And again, that will be clearly announced. Every morning at 11 o'clock, we continue our reading of the Bible. And I intend that that should be a permanent thing that we should continue every day except Sunday at 11 o'clock to read the scripture. We're currently at Genesis chapter 7. The videos will, God willing, stay up permanently or semi-permanently on the YouTube channel. You can start at any time. So do, do take a look at that if you haven't yet. Keep remembering our church in prayer. Keep supporting one another. I am available on 0777 925 7284 and on 02838318158 always. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 10 and I'm going to begin at verse 34. The Apostle Peter is um, is speaking to Christians. He has discovered a number of Gentiles who have been converted to Christianity and that's where we find him in verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. This is God's word. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some time. I don't know uh, if you've paid attention much to the dispute that has been rumbling on, which is sort of resolved in the Balkans between the people of the country now calling itself North Macedonia and Greece. Now, um, there's been a dispute because the Macedonians have been calling themselves Macedonians for a number of years after the breakup of Yugoslavia. And they call themselves Macedonians on the very reasonable basis that they are actually the inhabitants of the territory of ancient Macedonia. Um, ah, say the Greeks, 
Uh, there is a part of Greece that also used to be part of official Macedonia, of ancient Macedonia. You should tell your country somewhere else. Uh, we were here first, choose some other name. And the Macedonians, in a referendum in order to placate the Greeks, uh, they didn't do it very effectively, but uh, in order to placate the Greeks, agreed to call their country North Macedonia, which uh, is a reasonable solution to such a problem as we have seen ourselves on this island. But it can be a bit confusing. Balkan politics is often a bit confusing, actually. There are, however, other and worse confusions in this world. Whenever you look at this scripture and whenever you look at other scriptures, and then you look at Christianity today, especially in America, what you see is that many people confuse the term Israel with the country that is calling itself currently Israel. They, they confuse Israel, the people of God, with Israel, the modern nation state. And this can sometimes be a problem because it does sometimes lead them to excuse Israel, the nation state, from the same standards of behavior that we should all expect from a free and modern democracy. That's what Israel is in the end. Now, I would say we should all be sympathetic to Israel. Many of us remember what it is like to be under attack from terrorism. We should be sympathetic to its plight as a nation. We should be sympathetic to its situation as a country surrounded by enemies and besieged by terrorism. We should acknowledge that the history of the Jewish people in the 20th century has been such that we should be especially sensitive to prejudice or hatred against them. But it does need to be said again and again, the state of Israel is different from Israel, the people of God. The land of Israel, as it exists uh, in the Middle East today, should be held to the same standards of behavior as France or Germany or the United Kingdom and should not be excused as many people excuse it because they are under the mistaken impression that it is the national embodiment of the chosen people of God. It is no such thing. Another associated confusion is the idea that the Christian church has replaced Israel as the chosen people of God. Now that is a bit closer to the mark, but it's still wrong. And we know that it's wrong because among other strong evidence of what we see in this little passage of Acts chapter 10. And what we see here is that God has always accepted those who obey him from all nations. We see it in verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. There are quite a few examples, lots of examples, in fact, of people who are from other nations who have been accepted as part of the people of God. Ruth's a good example. Ruth was a Moabites. She was from one of the nations which was thought least off by the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, we read this, No Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Now that seems pretty conclusive if you take it on its own. But the context, as I often say, that we need to understand that every piece of scripture in is every other piece of scripture. They're all complementary. They're not contradictory. So the story of Ruth, a Moabites, and her descendants makes us modify our understanding of that scripture from Deuteronomy. Those who refuse to accept God as their God are excluded. But those who accept him and adopt his ways and become one with his chosen people clearly, if God's choice rests on them, are accepted. We see that in Ruth, Ruth chapter 4. We see that she was the ancestor, an ancestor of David. And through David she was a, an ancestor of Joseph and of Mary, his descendant. The spiritual and physical ancestor of Jesus himself. No one claims 
that Ruth was not engrafted into the people of God, that her descendants were not part of the people of choice. In the New Testament, you see people who are converts to the Jewish religion from the Gentile nations. Not all of them thought much of by Jesus, frankly. In Matthew 23, 15, he tells the Jewish leaders he's disputing with, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert, and you make the convert twice as much a child of hell as yourself. The thing is that the converts were accepted because they themselves accepted the faith and customs of the Jewish church. God can't be reached in multiple ways by different people. We're all in need of his intervention in our lives. He lays down one way in which, his, in which people can approach him. In the Old Testament, before the coming of Christ, that way was through the worship of the temple and the keeping of the ritual law and through the uh, mediation of the priesthood. But then in God's good time, the plan of salvation for his people came to fruition. And in the New Testament, we see that Christ came to save those who are the people of God. As for the word that he sent to Israel, we read from verse 36, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. There is one way to God. There's one name through whom all who will be saved are to be saved. Jesus Christ, crucified, dead, buried, risen, ascended. With Christ in Christ, the worship of the temple is fulfilled. The sacrifices of sheep and of goats and pigeons and cattle, the wine, the, the libation or drink offering that was made with them, the gifts of flour and oil, all of these sacrifices were symbols or metaphors for the body and blood of Christ. His sacrifice on the cross is the once and for all sacrifice that fulfills the promises and the sacrifices of the Old Testament. When he came, the worship of the temple as an active living thing was changed. And although the old sacrifices went on for a while until the Romans destroyed the temple about 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, they now meant nothing. The Jews were shown the one way to come to God, to have a much closer and more intimate personal relationship with him than they were ever able to have through the Old Testament worship of the temple. The ritual laws were fulfilled as well. And God's people were set free from the obligation to obey them. But that's for another day. The important thing to understand is that Christ fulfilled the work of the temple. His sacrifice was the fulfillment of the promises held in all offerings to God in the Old Testament. And the Jewish people were shown the way to salvation through Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Up until now... Those who had been taught this truth and accepted it, whether they were born Jews or Jewish converts, were part of the Old Testament tradition. They were Jews by religion, whether or not they were Jews by blood or descent. But here something very clearly changes. God intervenes to show the church something very important. That means that you and I are able to sit in our own homes now, but united in worship, uh, worshipping God as he wishes to be worshipped. We see that the uh, Gentiles are engrafted into Israel and we conclude that we are the church and that we are Israel. They are the same. Read from verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. 
Now, I want to talk um, about the way that the Holy Spirit worked during the Apostolic Age at the start of the Christian Church and about the gift of tongues in particular later in the year. It is worth noticing that the people hearing the tongues spoken by Gentile believers understood what they were saying, that they were extolling God in languages, human languages that they had no knowledge of, but which were perfectly intelligible. But that again waits for another day. You can watch this space. What's important to see here is that the choice of God rests on these people who were not Jews by religion or by descent or by tradition or by culture. And yet, without their converting to the Jewish religion, God's choice rested on them and they were given the gift of the Holy Spirit in just the same way as those who were blood, cultural, religious Jews. Peter the Apostle, who was, remember, a believing, obedient Jew of impeccable Jewish ancestry himself, he realised what was happening. And he realised that this was a turning point in the understanding of the church about what Christ had achieved on the cross and accepted those Gentiles as fellow believers. Because the things that Gentiles had to do uh, to be equally part of the church had changed. Where once Jew and Gentile alike had to accept the rituals of the temple, the mediation of the priests, the uh, sacrifices, the uh, regulations of the Old Testament faith. Now Gentile and Jew alike came to God through faith in Jesus Christ and worshipped God in spirit and in truth. Israel wasn't replaced by the church. It hasn't been replaced by the church. It became the church through Christ according to the eternal plan of God. For those um, who were saved from the Jewish religion first, convicted of sin and brought to faith in Christ. And then as we see in this passage, Gentiles chosen by God, convicted of sin, and now Jews and Gentiles together, people of all races and nations and cultures, convicted and saved in the same way, together in the same body, the church. The church does not replace Israel. The church is Israel. Names could be confusing things. Uh, as uh, the people who call themselves Macedonians and those other different people who also call themselves Macedonians could tell us if they were here. Israel is a name that confuses us because the same name is used to describe different things. We should never confuse Israel the nation state with Israel the people of God. The way that the church has sometimes confused those things uh, has caused a very great deal of difficulty and unhappiness and error, especially in the 20th and the 21st century. What we learn here in this passage from Acts chapter 10, where the Apostle Peter preaches to some Gentiles who believe in Christ, who receive the Holy Spirit without converting first to the Jewish religion, understood in context is this. God has always accepted those who obey him from all nations. Christ came to save those who are the people of God, that the Gentiles are engrafted into Israel and that the church does not replace Israel. The church is Israel. Amen. Don't forget the Bible readings at 11 o'clock every morning except Sunday. This Sunday at 11 o'clock, God willing, there will be a service of worship broadcast on our YouTube channel and here on our Facebook page. And... Uh, the decision of the Kirk sessions in the light of what the government uh, advises us about our meetings will be communicated to you as soon as possible. We hope very much that we'll be able to meet together in our meeting houses before very long.